Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our regularly scheduled Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Birmingham. The City recommends the members of the public wear a mask if they have been exposed to COVID-19 or have a respiratory illness. City staff, commission, and all board and committee members must wear a mask if they have been exposed to COVID-19 or actively have a respiratory illness. We do provide uh, KN95 respirators and other triple air masks in the back if you fall in that category. The, um, we are still doing some meetings virtually. So if you are on Zoom and you are um, requesting an appeal today, we will uh, bring you into the meeting and, and unmute you and you can present your case to us. Um, anyone that's on Zoom potentially that would like to comment, you would use the raised hand feature. And when we notice the raised hand at the time that we allow for public comment, uh, we will call on you. The um, BZA members are volunteers and we receive no compensation. We are appointed by the city commission for a staggered three year term. We actually have three board members that were recently um, re-upped for lack of a better term. So we'll welcome back Mr. Reddy, Mr. Lilly, and Mr. Yaldo. They have been uh, reappointed for our three year terms. The United States, uh, excuse me, the United States statutes, the BZA hears three types of appeal. Uh, we hear dimensional or non-use variances, including sign variances. That does require a four affirmative votes of this board. And you must show a practical difficulty complying with the dimensional requirements of the ordinance. We have all four of our appeals currently are dimensional. We also look at use variances and appeals of interpretation of rulings. I believe one of our cases is um, asking for us to look at a interpretation or a ruling. So we will um, be discussing that again. Our procedure is all comments are addressed to myself, the chair. Please wait to be recognized. The city staff will first make a presentation regarding the appeal and then take questions from the board members. The appellant is then invited to present their case. Only one person for a case can um, address the board. There can be exceptions for technical support like an architect or an engineer. Members of the public after that presentation are invited to come forward, identify themselves and provide their comments to the board. The hearing is then closed and the motions from the board are entertained and acted on. In all cases, this is not a popularity contest. Granting or denying a variance is based substantially on the appellate meeting their burden of proof. Can we please call the roll of the board? Eric Morgan. Here. Jason Canvasser. Here. Kevin Hart. Here. Richard Lilly. Here. John Miller. Here. Ron Reddy. Here. Pierre Yaldo. Here. So we have a full board. I'll call the um, appellants. First, we have someone here for 1511 East Maple Road. And I believe they're on. Oh, go ahead. Mr. Hurst, is that you? Are you here for that case? Yes, good evening. Very good. We'll call you in a few minutes. For. Um, 479 South Old Woodward. Very good. So usually we choose the cases that have a little bit more complexity, especially with the appeal to take at the end of the evening so we can get the three dimensionals move quicker. Are you okay with that? Very good. So we'll move you to the fourth spot. Um, is someone here for 220 Lake Park? Thank you. And lastly for 839 Ridgedale. Very good. So everyone is here. Is there any other uh, correspondence, Mr. Johnson, that we haven't seen? There's not. Very good. Um, have the appellants received any of those copies? Well, there's nothing else they have to see. For the um, last minutes from our last scheduled meeting, do we have any changes? Mr. Canvas, sir. Yeah, a um, couple changes. On page four, uh, the roll call vote lists my name. Um, I believe that should be Kona, because I was absent. Same thing on page six, um, at the top and the bottom, uh, and on page seven. So I think that's four instances where I was credited with votes, but uh, board member, alternative board member Kona should be credited with those votes. What was the third one? Uh, it's page, there's two of them on page six. Appeal two, appeal three, and appeal four on page seven. Any others? 
think I got all those instances. All right. Mr. Lilly? Um, <clears throat> on page four for the um, roll call in the middle of the page, uh, the wrong Lilly is there. And also on page six, there are two of them there. Both of those should be me. And on page seven, the last one should be me also, not Chuck. Very good. Any other amendments to the, to the minutes? Seeing none, do we have a motion? Motion. Mr. Reddy, you had a motion? Motion to approve the minutes. We have a second? Second. Mr. Lilly, so we have a motion to approve and a second. All in favor of approving the minutes as amended? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the minutes are approved. So we will hear our first case. It sounds like it's on Zoom for 1511 East Maple. And the city will present. Jeff Zilke here to present case 22-50, property known as 1511 East Maple. Request the following variance to construct the rear addition to an existing non-conforming home. Chapter 126, Article 4, Section 4.74C of the Zoning Ordinance requires that a minimum distance between principal residential buildings on adjacent lots be 14 feet or 25% a lot width, whichever is larger. The required is 20 feet on the east side the proposed is 17.20 feet, therefore a variance of 2.8 feet is being requested. This applicant was in front of the board back in June of 2022. Uh, the minutes were attached and still looking to do the exact same rear addition to the home. And as I was getting further in the review process, it came to my knowledge that the variance requested amount was in an error back in June. That's why they're back here tonight looking for the 2.80 feet. Instead of back in June, it was 0.8 feet of a variance. Any questions? Members, any questions? Mr. Yaldo? Could you just uh, clarify a little more? Was did So the plans did not change at all. It was just an error in stating the amount that was requested. Correct. It was uh, an error on uh, adding up the total side yards for the distance between. So we're looking at the 8.57 and the 8.7, correct? Correct. And is the adjacent home, what's the required setback for the adjacent home? Side that side adjacent home, if I remember correctly, it would had to be 14 feet because it was a little bit narrow over a lot. Um, with the the, the appellant's home at 80 feet, that's where the 20 feet was required. The house to the right, it's a narrower lot where that would be required at 14 feet for their distance between. But with the lot being 80 feet, they need the 20 feet on the appellant's uh, lot that they're asking for. Are you saying the 8.7 is that house is a non conforming house with the 8.7? No, it, it conforms as that sits, but the distance between, they're 14 feet, so they conform with the distance between structures. This lot being wider, they need 20 feet. That's where the 17.8 oh, feet or 2 feet is, and then they need the 2.8 foot variance. And if you recall, the addition is just going straight out from the rear, creating that same distance uh, between structures. That's okay. right. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Hart? Yes, uh, Mr. Zilke. So this this request, re revised request, does not make the neighboring property go out of compliance. It's still in compliance, correct? I mean, that is correct. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. In the minutes, uh, Mr. Hart had mentioned that there was unique aspects of the property. Do Do we recall what those unique aspects were? I don't know. I, was there anything unique about this lot, I guess, is, is, I don't remember if there was an elevation issue or if it was, just trying to refresh my memory. No, I think it was just probably back, it, it expanded the 
the total side yard setbacks, it was non-conforming, existing, non-conforming. I don't recall a uniqueness per se. Okay. Mr. Miller? I, I believe that that was, was due to the fact that there's adjacent lots of different widths. So that throws the numbers throw the, the numbers off in this in this case. Maybe the repellent could remind us of any of those issues when they yeah. present. Thank any, you. Any other questions on Mr. Zilke? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Can we unmute Mr. Hurst? Mr. Hi, good evening. Uh, just as uh, Jeff had stated, this is just coming back in to uh, reconfirm. Mr. Hurst, can you just give us your full name, your address, and where you're currently videoing from? Absolutely. Uh, my full name is Jason Hurst, uh, and I reside at 1511 East Maple. And you're videotaping from Birmingham, Michigan? Correct. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, again, this is just coming in uh, to get reapproval uh, from the last time due to the uh, clerical error. Uh, we're not changing plans from the original uh, submission. Uh, we're just seeking approval so we can start getting our contractor set up. So I guess my, my first question would be, um, you know, very often when we have a existing non-conforming home, we always ask, you know, is there an attempt to mitigate? Could you have made this proposed addition offset one foot inward or, or two feet inward? Was there a consideration to try to minimize the need to come in in line with the non-conforming wall? And if, if not, is there a reason why you, did, you couldn't? So initially we, we had thought uh, about making those jogs, uh, but after some discussion uh, with some contractors, it would have been uh, a little more difficult for like gutter, gutter runs, uh, you know, foundation issues. Uh, it was just deemed that this would be the easiest and uh, uh, basically the, the best route for us to do. Very good. Other questions for Mr. Hurst? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Online or in the audience, does anybody have a comment about this particular appeal? Seeing none, board members? Mr. Reddy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion uh, with regards to uh, 1511 East Maple, appeal 22-50. I would move to approve the variance. I think the fact scenario here is virtually identical from when we approved this in June. There is a slight additional um, requirement here of two feet. It doesn't appear to be the appellant's fault that this uh, uh, error was not noted at a previous meeting. So I would move to approve this uh, tied to the plans uh, as set forth uh, to us tonight. I'll second the motion. Yep, I believe uh, we heard all the uh, statements about uh, that, that allowed us to make the decision. It wasn't self-created. Uh, the variance does substantial justice to the owner, neighboring property owners, and it's not contrary to spirit or intent of the ordinance. So I'll second. We have a motion to approve and second. Do we have any discussion? I will support the motion. I, I just want to comment that this is an existing non-conforming property, so this addition does not add to the nonconformity. It's, it's equal to, and so it you know does do substantial justice in that they are not exacerbating that nonconformity, but staying within the the foundation and roof perimeter of the property. So we have a motion to approve. Can we call the roll? Ron Reddy. Yes. Carrie Alda. Yes. Jason Kavisser. Yes. Kevin Hart. Yes. Richard Lilly? Yes. Tom Miller? Yes. Eric Morgoroth? Yes. Congratulations, Mr. Hurst. You have your variance. Our next case is for 22 48 for 220 Lake Park. Who will be speaking on behalf of Lake Park? I will be. Okay. Would you mind coming up to the podium? Do you want to hear from Jeff? Oh, I'm sorry. I want to hear from Jeff. Good <laughs> <laughs> point. I was eager to hear this case. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Jeff Zoki again here present case 22-48, property known as 220 Lake Park. Request the following variance to construct the front addition to an existing home. Chapter 126, Article 4, Section 4.75A1 of the Zoning Ordinance requires that private attached single family residential garages must be set back a minimum of five feet from the portion of the front facade on the first floor of the principal building that is further set back from the property line. The proposed garage is 95 feet in front of the furthest facade, therefore a variance of 100 feet is being requested. If you can kind of zoom in a little bit, the furthest portion of the front facade is this little bump out over here, which puts it 95 feet in front of this and it's required to be five feet back from that portion. Uh, so therefore the 100 foot variance is being requested. So Mr. Zuki, it's not really a, an effect of this kind of flagpole shaped house. It's really just that this is where the front door is now and they're adding this garage in front of it and I wanna see if that's something we can do. That's fair. That is fair. I know the existing garage is actually back here and it drops down in its kind of basement entrance garage. Um, and the lot is, I don't remember the exact dimension, it's far enough back. It meets all the ordinances in the front, but it just doesn't meet the being five foot behind the portion of the front facade that's for this back. Good. Other questions for Mrs. Okay, Mr. Yellman. I, I recall seeing a statement in there about how about 50% of the proposed addition is garage space. Is the rest just hallway space, basically? Or is, is there any rooms being added? Or There is rooms up above the garage. So it's a, a bonus, I'm going to say a bonus room. I know the uh, appellant can speak more of what's going on up top. Um, the garage is attached. Uh, it is a, a go to an elevation here. Um, there is living space in there. It is attached. The area, the breezeway in between does meet living space, a habitable room. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. So is there any differentiation between the garage must be versus if there were multiple garages, if one falls behind the front door by five feet, is it, does it reference any and all garages? You know what I'm saying? It's... It's as if it's an attached garage, it has to be behind the five foot. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Zoki? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Perfect. Do you want me to do that or are you going to do it quicker? Uh, I, can, I can do the clicker for you. Okay, I've got the bullet points are um, animated. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Gail McGregor with Williams, Williams, Ratner and Plunkett at 380 North Old Woodward in Birmingham. And the homeowners are here, uh, Lindsay and Robert Mardigian. Uh, so if you have any questions for them, um, they're here as well. Uh, yes, we're asking for a variance for a, an addition to the front of the house. Um, and if you go to the next slide, as you'll see that this this lot is a flag-shaped lot. It's pretty unique in the city of Birmingham uh, just for being flag-shaped, but also it has frontage on uh, Corton Lake. That That's what you see on the left. On the right is the street view of the house. So you basically cannot see the facade of this house from Lake Park Drive. The house that you see there to the left of the driveway is the neighbor the house that sits directly to the west. And this addition is going to be directly behind that house that you can see there from the street. So it will not be visible from the street at all. So next slide. So the problem here has to do with the current garage uh, that was built by the previous owners of this house. It's a basement garage, as Jeff said. Uh, it has a... Uh, uh, very steep slope going down and it only has a 15 foot wide clearance so as you can see there there's a Ford Explorer 
it's it's really difficult to pull into that garage underneath and then getting out it's virtually impossible to get out the, the visibility is very difficult you have to back out of that ramp and uh, when you're coming out up to the grounds level there's you the driver cannot see if there's any obstruction at ground level so it's a pretty dangerous situation especially for a family like the Margigians who have young children uh, you, you pretty much would have to be 10 feet up above in order to see what's what's there um, at the top of the driveway so that's that's the the problem next slide the solution is to build a garage addition off the front you can see on the left the current situation and then on the right is the uh, proposed garage addition. It'll be a two-story addition. Um, there will be a mud room in between. The current driveway that goes down to the basement garage will, mo will no longer be functional, so that garage will no longer be used as a garage um, because the new addition will block that. Uh, as you can also see from um, that photo, the, these renderings, the house is the the driveway down into the basement garage is more or less on the lot line there's no space on either side of the existing house to build a garage on the side and then on the back side um, with the site plan that jeff showed you a minute ago there isn't enough space on the lake side to build a structure on the back of the house without violating the setbacks. Okay, so um, as you probably know already that the ordinance provides that you can hear these dimensional variances where there's a practical difficulty or an un unnecessary hardship in carrying out the strict letter of the ordinance. There are four criteria to determine whether or not a variance, variance is warranted. The first is special conditions applicable to the property in question. Uh, the provisions of the ordinance, if strictly applied, will unreasonably prevent the property owner from using it for a permitted purpose. Uh, the second criteria is literal enforcement of the chapter will result in an unnecessary hardship. The third is granting the variance will not be contrary to the spirit and purpose of the ordinance, nor contrary to public health, safety, and welfare. And the last is the granting of the variance will result in substantial justice to the property owner, the owners in the area, and to the general public. So I'm going to just take you briefly through these four criteria. So first, the strict application here will unreasonably prevent the petitioners from using their property for permitted use. Uh, the current basement garage is unsafe, and access by a typical vehicle is, is virtually impossible because of the clearance and turning radius and the slope geometry of the ramp. The side and rear yard setbacks, as I said, prohibit placing the addition behind the facade or the rear of the property. The unique characteristics of the property, its flag shape and its um, abutment to Court and Lake render it impossible for the petitioners to conform to the ordinance. And the, uh, finally, the strict application of the ordinance, the garage, attached garage ordinance specifically would unreasonably prevent the petitioners from using their property as a, a single family home with an attached garage which is permitted by the ordinance secondly literal enforcement of the ordinance will re result in an unnecessary hardship um, again the unique shape of the lot the Port and lake frontage no side yard or rear yard setback um, Space to put such an addition and the petitioners at no fault of their own will be unable to safely park cars and to get cars in and out of that garage the existing garage um, without the variance the the challenges that are presented by this unique location fronting on court and lake and by the safety hazard of the current garage which was designed by a prior owner are the factors primarily precluding strict compliance with the letter of the, the zoning ordinance the practical difficulty and necess unnecessary hardship experienced by, by petitioner are not self-created they exist because of the size and shape of the lot and because of the the um, design of the current 
the current garage with the unsafe ramp. Third, granting the requested variance uh, would not be contrary to the spirit and purpose of the ordinance, nor contrary to the public health, safety, and welfare. Um, with respect to the master plan in the Birmingham 2016 plan, um, this, this property is R1 residential, and that's what it's slated to be uh, under the master plan. The garage ordinance 4.75 SS02A, it's intended to, to prohibit street facing houses where the facade is entirely the garage. Um, and this, this addition will not be that, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, it will only take up 28% of the frontage uh, and under the garage, attached garage ordinance, there's, it's a 50% standard. So we're, we're well under the standard of the attached garage. Um, so the only, the only request here is that it be in the front as opposed to the side or the back. So this, these photos show you the intent of the ordinance. Uh, the pictures above are all, you know, quote unquote, garage houses, which is something that the ordinance is meant to prohibit. And the picture below, which I already showed, shows what the street looks like, what this house looks like from the street, which is, really isn't visible from the street, and this addition will not be visible from the street. So we're not creating a situation here that the ordinance was intended to prohibit. And finally, granting the requested variance will result in substantial justice to the petitioners, um, the owners of the prop other properties in the area, and to the general public. So this, this addition would bring a new, new, newly constructed addition that's aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing and to the, a one-of-a-kind house in Birmingham. This house is unique, its location on Corton, Lake, as well as the, the long driveway and the, the um, lack of visibility to the street. The proposed mudroom, studio, and bathroom, which are on the, the second floor, the mudroom is the, the connecting piece, and then the, the studio and bathroom on the second floor are all allowable uses in, under the ordinance. And it's only the garage use that is requiring the the, or the variance. Um, the rest, the other, the rest could be added on. Um, it's just the garage the, the, in front of the facade that is prohibited. So that's the need for the variance. And 50% um, of the garage or the addition is is for the garage. The rest of it is these permitted, the other permitted uses. The garage, again, will not visibly dominate because it's only 20% of the, the front elevation, 28% of the front elevation, which is less, as I said before, than the 50% that's allowable. So with respect to the neighboring properties, properties in the area, um, these are all properties in the area of this house on Lake Park that have three-car attached garages. So the, the garage itself is not going to be unusual for other properties in the area, this area of Birmingham. And lastly, this is a, a rendering, a concept design rendering that shows the existing home and the mudroom in between the, the new addition and the house, and then the two-story addition, three-car garage with the, uh, the studio use and a, a bathroom above. So in conclusion, granting the, the variance will provide relief in the following ways. Petitioner will be permitted to use the property for a permitted purpose, specifically a one single family house with an attached garage um, that's, that's workable in terms of parking cars. Uh, petitioners will be relieved of unfair and unnecessary hardship that would result from the literal enforcement of the zoning ordinance because there is no other place to put this on this lot. And uh, the variance requested if granted would be consistent with the spirit and purpose of the ordinance and would also be consistent with public health, safety, and welfare. Again, the slope of the ramp coming out of the existing garage is dangerous. Uh, and as well, the, the spirit and purpose of the ordinance is to prevent the garage house, 
where the whole frontage is taken up by the garage, and that's not the situation here. So uh, substantial justice would be resulted to the petitioners as well as other property owners in the area who have three car attached garages and to the general public. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what size is the current garage that's down the ramp? Two car? Is it two? Can you get two cars in there? We have one single door, so it's a 16 or an 18. It's a large door. Right. Um, putting two cars in there and trying to get them out is extremely challenging. Right, but a single door is a, a car. Right, a single I door is a two car you. garage, right? Yeah. So I guess my question is that, you know, I, I recognize that you've established that there's no side yard setback available, or side yard space because of the setbacks available on the side, and this garage doesn't function properly, but you're now adding a three car garage that's extended off with a mudroom that extends beyond trying to replace an unfunctional garage, but creating obviously a beautiful addition, but you know, requiring a 100 foot variance. Is there a reason why we aren't replacing a two car for a two car or doing something to minimize the variance request? I, I, I think that it, it, it would be best to ask the homeowner, but I think the thought here is if they're going to add a, an addition, they want to be able to have the, the new uh, uses up top and get maximize what they can get out of the garage. And a three-car garage is pretty typical for this neighborhood. It's not anything that's unusual, and, and it would really be replacing a garage that's not functionable right now right but you see my my point is that you're saying there's a practical difficulty in, in, in having a functional garage and because the lot doesn't allow for this functional garage to exist area, on areas of the lot that would be allowable we're not going to put it on the front of the property but we're asking for much more than a functional garage we're asking for an extension with the mudroom in front of the three cars well, and each of those pushes that pushes that variance limit I understand that, but the garage, if, if they were just adding an addition that just had a mud room and living space, that wouldn't be an issue. They could build that. So they could build the structure just as it is presented, as long as it didn't have garage, a garage function. Right. So I, you know, I guess that would be my, my answer, is that they're not really asking for, for something that the ordinance wouldn't otherwise allow, which would be an addition of that same size and that same height. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Mr. Reddy. I'd like to follow up on that. This is actually a huge variance request. It's 100 feet. That's bigger than probably my lot is in Birmingham, the entire variance you're asking for. So my follow-up question would be, uh, according to the diagram here, you have uh, room for bikes, uh, you have a three-car garage, you have the mud room. That adds up to a significant um, variance that I think, frankly, could be adjusted for a more modest uh, position where you have, you're asking for less, because that's always what we have to worry about, is how much is a request here, and it's 100 feet, which is, a, as you know, a very large variance. I, I agree it's a large variance, but even with the variance, there's still, we're not into the, to the front open space at all. We're not asking to go into the front yard setback at all. We're still well <laughs> within the, the ordinance with respect to setbacks and distances between structures. So there's still a lot of front yard in this lot once this addition is put on. It's not going to be inconsistent with the size of the lot or with the neighborhood or with the neighboring property. Well, I concur that there is the current garage is not workable. I concur with that. The issue I have is the length and extent of the variance that you're asking for. There's a lot of moving parts to this. It's almost literally a house, and I think you've got it listed as 2,700 square feet of new space here. So that would be my concern, and you've addressed it, and I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Johnson, you had a comment? I just wanted to bring up a, a point that, a de following on uh, what the appellant's saying about the, the front open space, other than that, there's plenty of front open space there. A detached accessory structure could be built in that space that was not attached to the house so you're saying because that, there is so much room. So if the mudroom were not there, hypothetically, this would not require a variance. Correct. Okay. Mr. Campson, you have a question? Go ahead, Mr. Hart. Hart? Uh, but Bruce, to clarify that, though, that, that detached structure would be in the front yard, technically, right? 
Yeah, but I was just Sweet. reading the zoning ordinance and for detached accessory structure, snow accessory structure, or structure shall be erected in the required front open space or required side open space. This house is so far back from the front property line, which is kind of unique. There is room in that front open space to build a detached accessory structure. So you're saying more to the west of where the current Campus? Yeah, just to follow up. So if they, what is this? Is it still ten feet between structures? Yeah, they would have to follow all the other requirements for detached accessory structures being ten feet from the house, setbacks, and all of that. But this particular lot has that potential. So, just to follow that to its logical conclusion, if they put a ten foot gap between the garage and the house they could build that structure without a variance. Correct. And it could still be everything that they wanted, right? It just wouldn't be attached. Correct. Okay. So to the applicant, I guess, did you consider any alternatives that wouldn't require a variance? Well, of, I mean, of course, when you're looking at these things, you're, you're looking at all kinds of alternatives, but the, the norm in this neighborhood is for attached garages. Um, this is a this is a, a beautiful unique house on Quarton Lake and You know the the neighborhood is full of three car attached garages I don't know if I agree with that and I don't, I don't know if the norm is attached garages either. I, I live in this neighborhood um, I have a detached garage a lot of people have detached garages the newer homes may have attached garages. How old is this house? I think it was built in uh, around 2008, 2009, maybe, okay. time and frame. It's my recollection. Yeah, but they're not the so. original homeowners, right? They're not. They're not the people who built this house, no. Okay. Do we know if the previous owners used that garage as a garage? They did not. No. No, they did right. not. I mean, they could have obviously built a different garage without having an underground garage. They, they chose to do that. That was, that was their design. And, and obviously they knew it when they, they purchased the house. But, you know, it sounds like we have a couple options here. Ms. Campson, do you have a question for her? Yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> don't, worry, don't worry about that. Um, you, you ruined my chain of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, but in deter I, I, what I'm trying to get to is what mitigating analysis was done to determine, you know, if either well, something else could be very one of the mitigating factors here is that you can't this is this house you can't see from the street at all they're not asking for something that's funky this isn't this is going to be completely in line with the design of the home and with the size of the home and the size of the lot this isn't going to be a unicorn you know it's going to be a very nicely done beautiful house in the end with the addition um, there's like mr. Johnson said there's lots there's still lots of front yard it's not going to be up against the front setback and it's this house is set way back there's a very long driveway they need a special sign at the side of the driveway so that delivery people know like you know the Amazon truck knows where to go because you can't tell where this house is so that, that in and of itself is a mitigating factor. This is not right on the street. You're not going to see it from the street. Um, it, it's going to be very consistent with the style and the size, as I said, of the existing home. Just to follow up, doesn't, doesn't that cut against the argument, though, that this would do substantial justice? I mean, I'm not arguing that this is not attractive. It's not beautiful. I mean, it's a very well thought out and drawn plan, but if... If it isn't viewed from the street, how does that get to substantial justice of, of the neighbors, of the public, it, when nobody's going to see it? Right, exactly. You're making my point. Well, no, I th it's substantially, I'm, I'm ju it's the substantially just because it's not going to be a problem for anybody else. No one's going to visually be bothered to see this, this addition on the front of this house. Um, that's, that is substantial justice to, to the neighbors. It's not going to be a um, an eyesore for them. It's not going to 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 be bothersome to anybody at all. None. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Yalba? Yeah. So, um, 
first, I have a question about that photo because it doesn't look the same as the ones that are on the plans. Like it, that photo appears to omit the hallway portion of the building. Like it looks, that doesn't look like the 100 feet that uh, just doesn't look like the same shape as is pictured in the other drawings. And then I'm still sort of focused on why it has to be 100 when it couldn't be shorter. I'm focused on why the variance couldn't be reduced and how you justify us agreeing that that's the least amount of variance that's needed to get a garage up there and get rid of that problem of having an obsolete garage. So I would like to hear more about that. Um, and then I would, my question also is, is that what it looks like or or is there, a, am I missing, is that photo missing some section of the building that's going to be there? Uh, well, no, there there is a, there is a mud room in this picture. Okay. It's, it's, it's um, flagged there. The oval window? Yes, okay. right there. Okay. So it, it's, my, it's my understanding that this is, this is a this concept up. rendering. Okay. Um, and that, that, would, that is the mud room. Okay. Because I'm, um, I'm looking at the drawing that has the two photos side by side, one where there's the garage that's X'd out and the other one with the drawing. And in the top drawing there, it looks like that uh, hallway portion of the building is almost the length of the garage. So I'm just looking for some clarification there. Well, I, I don't think that that drawing is, this is not like, That's the one I'm looking this at is not a, a plan or a rendering. This is just to show you the, the concept of where the house sits on the lot, where the driveway currently is, and then what would, what would be put there in the addition. I, th this is not a plan with measurements. So that one is not an accurate depiction. It's the, the other on the other slide that you showed. Where it I, I would say no. That this is not an accurate depiction. This is just this is just a, a depiction to give you the idea of what was is currently there and what would be put there, and the, if the variance is granted. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. yeah I have two questions. One for uh, Mr. Zilke or Mr. Johnson. How many flag lots does Birmingham have in the? Community, but five. No, I'm not. Oh, don't just, quote me on that. But it's it's not a large number. But it's fairly. Yeah, you know, it's less than ten. We know. Um, yeah, I think so. Cause I know, I know four. I think it's two around the corner from this, and one off of Baldwin. Right, and we l last year we looked. We heard another request very similar to this that had a lot of constriction because of the flag lot, you know, we're, we're determining what is the front of the house, what is the back of the house, what, um, and, I, and I really want to try to um, make this a question to you, <laughs> Ms. McGregor, instead of it being a statement, but I mean, looking across, I went by the, the site today, went to the other side of the lake, and you would, you would not, there would be no way you'd be able to see this extension as proposed. But on the on the lake side, if we were to run the, we have a 23 foot drop. It's a substantial drop in the back. That's why I think the original designer put the garage below. But 15 feet from a garage door to a wall is um, I, I would have a hard time doing that with a bicycle, let alone a car. But my question to you, like, as with, with the ability to put it in the backyard on the lakeside, that would be a lot more obtrusive to the neighboring properties. With, Correct. I mean, you would, you, would be, you would be changing the, the character of the lakefront by putting a garage structure right on the lakefront. And the positioning, I guess I, I really want to know, because the positioning of this structure, it, it would be, we're talking about it adjacent to the south would be, uh, another person's backyard, which likely would have, uh, would there be any, would there be any view from the south? I'm mean, looking off of, of Waterfall Lane. I looked up uh, you know, down Lake Park, and I, I couldn't find any, I couldn't see anything from the street. I, I don't believe so. I've driven that neighborhood myself, and I, I could, I couldn't see the house. Okay. Um, now I didn't go on the other side of the lake. But I did, I did go around that neighborhood, and I don't think that it's visible um, from, from any of those. And I do know now, unfortunately, um, uh, 
the, I don't believe, I don't know if they're on Zoom or not, but the direct neighbors, um, Mr. Trot and, um, I don't remember the other one, my, my, the Mylods, they're both, they both are in favor of the, of the addition. So, you, you know. You can't speak for what I know, I'm sorry. But in any event, um, I don't think that it's, this addition will be visible. Uh, and this last question, I'm sorry. Uh, this will go to either Jeff or, or, or Mr. Zilke or you uh, or the appellant. I'm reading the, uh, the topographic. There's from the front step of this house to the back of the property line is a 23-foot drop. Is that, is that accurate, uh, Mr. Zilke? Do you see it? Yes, it's pretty up. accurate. I know the floodplain runs yeah, almost behind of, that house. At the edge of the property, it's a 734 elevation, 734, and we're up as high as 751 point, almost 752. So it's a substantial drop in the property along with it. Um, I, I, that's my, my understanding of it. Um, Yes, and I know the floodplain actually runs part way. I'm not exactly sure, but I know it's kind of fairly close to the back of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, looking, because I know at one point there's a pool being looked at, and I know the floodplain kind of falls in that area. So the floodplain would actually be a, be very difficult to get approval for that. We'd have to go to the DNR, for, or the appellant would have to go to the DNR for Correct. approval. Of that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the... Seeing none, thank you. In the audience or on Zoom, anyone not directly affiliated with this particular appeal have any comments about the appeal? See nothing on Zoom, nothing in the audience. We will close public comments. Board members. I'd like to make a motion um, for 220 Lake Park. Uh, motion to approve um, you know simply I believe that this problem is completely due to the unique circumstance of this property um, those circumstances are, are very unusual certainly with respect to this home and the home in relation to the uh, to the surrounding neighborhood the problem was not self-created the lot is incredibly atypical um, and I believe that our ordinance in this matter is absolutely not applicable in any really practical sense. Um, so I believe that strict compliance with the ordinance would be unreasonable. Um, again, I motion to approve, and I would tie it to the plans as submitted. We have a motion to approve. Second. And we have a second from Mr. Hart. Do we have um, any comments about this? Mr. Canvasser, sir. I, I'm not going to um, support the motion. We, we've heard from the city that the structure can be built. Um, it can be built substantially the same size, dimensions, location, and everything else. It just needs to be appropriately set apart from the building. Um, and so I don't believe we've seen a showing that compliance with the ordinance is unnecessarily burdensome. And so um, for that reason alone, well, for that reason alone, I, I would not support the motion, but I'd also note that I think there's been a lack of any detail or attention to efforts to mitigate. So that also um, would be another reason that I, I can't support the motion. Very good. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Aldo, please. Um, I think it was it's important to note the fact that it stated that only 50% of the space being added is being used as a garage, but it doesn't look like any of the non-garage space is on the first floor. It's all above the garages, so it's not like they're squeezing extra, you know, increasing the variance by need of adding non-garage space. And then I'll just note that some of my concerns about seeing those images of it were alleviated, knowing that the image I saw projecting a much longer hallway isn't actually what the plan shows. So that was important to me. Very good. I am I will support the motion. I, I'm torn in this one. I do believe that there is a way that this could be built without a variance, but I do believe that the way you would build it without a variance would look substantially similar to what's here, and I don't think that it would be reasonable or substantial justice to the appellant to force them to 
walk outside of their home to this structure that would be the same structure with the same protrusion, with the same appearance if you were on their property. I don't think that's fair and reasonable since the structure will be there anyway. I also agree that the ordinance does not really consider a lot of this size and shape and having the garage, garages be the main focus on a front facing garage on an in town lot is a important consideration for in town, but this is just not that. The lot is set back. The topography of the lot from front to back drops so much that there is really no practical area to build this. So I'll do it, although I do take pause at providing a potentially, if we, if we agree, a 100 foot variance, I do think the lot is unique enough, the topography is unique enough, and placing it into the front yard um, that does allow for it, even if we detach it, would not do substantial justice because the structure would still be there and would still look the same. So for that reason, I will support the motion. No more comments? Can we call the roll? The motion is to approve. Juan Miller? Yes. Kevin Hart? Yes. Richard Lilly? Yes. Eric Gorgonoff? Yes. Ron Reddy? No. Kerry Alba? Yes. Jason Canvasser? No. Congratulations, you've had your variance. Our next case is for 839 Ridgedale. Looks like Mr. Zoki is up again. Silky here to present case 22-49, property known as 939 or 839 Ridgedale, request a following variance to construct the second floor addition to an existing non-conforming home. Chapter 126, Article 2.08.2 of the Zoning Ordinance requires that a minimum front yard setback is the average of homes 200 feet each way. The required is 32.70 feet. The existing and proposed is 28.3 feet, therefore a variance of 4.40 feet is being requested. This applicant was in front of the board back in February of 2022, minutes were attached. The applicant is back requesting the same variance that was granted for the expansion of the existing dormer width. Uh, the plans were some revisions to the first floor, which we deemed substantially revised, so that's where they're back in front of you tonight. Um, it is an enclosed porch on the front. They are looking to keep it enclosed. Um, for the plans that were in front of you back in February was opening up the porch. Any questions? So are any of the changes, even though the variance request dimensions are the same, are they, they don't add to any increased nonconformity, correct? Correct. The existing porch that was enclosed is going to remain that. It was just the dormer up on that second level being expanded. Okay. Where that's the variance that I was requesting in that time. Very good. Board members? Mr. Miller? Um, yeah, by previously the, the porch was turned back into a porch. It was unenclosed if Correct. you will, which would have put that piece back in compliance because instead of the house being forward, that it became a porch that was forward. The, the reason I'm saying this is that is that part of the approval last time was about the, uh, the addition of that mitigation to kind of balance out the uh, the need for a uh, um, for a uh, um, the, the second floor to be approved because that moved forward into the into the uh, front yard. So they they were expanding the second floor, but the first floor was basically being pulled back initially. Yes, the dormer was just getting, it was in the same spot, it was getting wider, right. wasn't coming forward, right. but yes, opening up that porch was. So they, 
creating right. an open porch on that first floor. So they needed the appeal for the second floor was being mitigated in a way by the first floor being pulled back. So now they still want to, they're still appealing that second floor for a variance, but they're taking away what they had, what was a mitigation previously in terms of making that a porch down below. Correct. It would, opening up would have gave it an open front porch to meet the zone. But but that's the only aspect that changed is that first first floor um, enclosure remaining. Correct. I know the appellate can speak to. It. We had some conversations as why it came to this and the changes in the plans. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Mr. Zilke? Thank you, sir. Who will be speaking on behalf of this appeal? I know you look familiar. Hi. Come back. Uh, my name is Art Lang. I'm the architect representing Mug Trees, um, the homeowner. Uh, yeah, your, we're basically. Can you provide us your address too, please? Oh, I'm sorry, 312 South Adams in Birmingham. Um, yeah. Uh, when we originally came, we we were the the porch. Right now, we're we're actually create. We were trying to create a porch. The originally there was a porch on the house because we found the foundation work below um, supported the idea that there was a roughly like a five foot deep porch on it. Um, it it's not really an enclosed porch right now. It's part of the living space. So the family room you see up front. Um, if we could put a. Um, so if you look at uh, either the, the existing or what we're proposing below, um, it's not a porch that's been enclosed. It's basically a porch that disappeared <laughs> over, over the years somehow. And so that porch was, we basically inherited this roughly about a five foot um, dimensional um, discrepancy there. It should have probably remained a porch. I don't know how it was approved over the years, but it, um, so what we were, we were hoping it was a feather in our cap as we wanted that porch originally, but now we're just basically asking if you'd reconsider without us uh, building a porch, carving it back into the house. Um, we're not, we're not really, it's not a porch right now at all. Uh, we were gonna kind of create a porch which would have solved that first floor problem voluntarily, I'd like to say. Um, but it did, you know, help the, the idea of, you know, like mitigating the existing non-conforming use. So um, we're not asking to push that second floor further towards the street. We're just strictly asking the very same variance, widening it, no dimensional change there. Um, and it's basically, um, we looked at the whole house as, so we saw you back in um, February, went into documentation and we went into pricing and uh, all kinds of builders and stuff like that. We had to realize just how far we wanted to push some of the, the spaces. And uh, that's why we, we wanted to come back because we knew it was tied to the original request. Mr. Miller. Yeah, um, so this was a cost savings move? Um, but was you, you, you wrote that it was value engineering. Yeah, value engineering. Yeah, it's yeah, basically um, there's a lot of components as we, that we're doing under the roof that are part of the stuff we're permitting, we've actually permitted for. And um, that part of the house, I know that you can't talk about economics as hardship. I understand that. But that was the part of the house that made the most sense to eliminate as far as scope of work to make the project function. Well, yeah, you're doing an extensive renovation here. And I'm bringing up this point, and my concern is I, I made the motion to approve last time. Uh, it was based on, on you know, that uh, the proposed remodeling would, would partially mitigate an existing nonconformity. That's, yeah, we understand. That's so, why we came back. We wanted to talk that through. We we do understand that. So that that was one of my reasons for for the approval. 
so when you value engineered, the one place that you decided to uh, um, to thrift, if you will, was was the part that that gave us that mitigation, which was part of the reason that I put forth for the approval. I so you put me in a little bit of a corner. No, I understand. Um, can you? Um, Um, just state again the need for your um, the need for your approval here. Um, we, we looked at it um, in two ways. Well, number one, we kind of inherited the 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 house has been remodeled quite a few times in the past, and we kind of inherited what was there. Um, the average front. We kind of discovered after we got into looking at it a little bit what, what our actual front setback was going to be. But um, to uh, if, if you look at this house, if, if you get familiar with it, um, intuitively I would normally do a master, I don't want to call it master, a main bedroom suite towards the back of a home. And we tend to put them on the private side of a house where you look to the backyards. If you look at this house, there was an addition put on the back that has a high kind of cathedral ceiling that cuts up into any kind of view out the backyard. So that back space with the fireplace that you see um, kind of cuts off opportunity to work in a master uh, main bedroom suite above. So the natural space that we had available was towards the front of the house. We had ability to get a nice suite with egress that we could easily obtain. This, the, there's a hallway that cuts the space in the middle that made it really difficult to, um, it would have kind of snowballed into all kinds of, if we tried to reposition the stair to get different spaces and try to move that space, the, the main bedroom uh, suite to other areas in the house, it would have snowballed into kind of an incredible amount of, uh, of gutting and, and restructuring. So we try to look at it you know, as the best way to uh, get that suite in there um, without really changing the footprint or anything. Other well, you're referring to the second floor, but you're showing the first floor here. Do you have it's, yeah. the second floor plan? There. There you go. That's okay. good. Sorry if I kind of point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I just... Uh, so, you know, all this, this area has been kind of remodeled. If you're in the house, these two bedroom spaces are very low. There's, there's kind of clip ceilings, uh, blue walls. It's, it's not a space that is real conducive to put a nice uh, main bedroom suite. There's no view out the back except for a tiny window because there's a high roof back here. So it just naturally started to dictate where we, we thought it was the smartest value engineering for the um, if you look at this dormer, it's very diminished, it's very small. I'm so sorry, I need you to be at the mic, otherwise I'm not going to pick it up on the recording. Okay. Um, sorry. I hope I'm making some sense. That it was a natural space to do it, but by the time you get a bathroom space in there, closet space, everything is very tight on, on the house. That's why we, we kind of worked with the front, and that's why we wanted to widen that dormer originally. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm raising my hand. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, Mr. Lang, me, when was the original house built? Um, it was right around 1914. 1914. So, so uh, the bungalow style, um, there's a there's a dormer on that. The uh, existing dormer has a gable on it that's not a bungalow style. Right. So somewhere in the history of this project, there was probably a dormer there? Um, well, I, we don't know. I mean, it, it, it would appear after poking around and, and looking at wall thicknesses and things, I, I had a couple theories on it without opening anything up yet. We weren't sure, but um, that was called the doghouse dormer that you see in the upper left there. Mm -hmm. um, it appears that that was there before, originally okay. there, but um, it's, it's got a low ceiling in there. It's about seven, under seven feet. Um, it almost looks like it may have been like a little sleeping porch or something because the way the wall thickness is almost like it was an exterior space at one time. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm making guesses. 
but um, it uh, it's very strange kind of space, that, especially when you, if you look back at the plan and how you access it, it's just. But I the mean, columns, the flavor of the house is mostly probably <coughs> called a bungalow style, yeah, so that the the shed dormer would probably be more in keeping with what the original design may have I, been. I think it would be equally appropriate. I mean, maybe not the width, but the, maybe the style. way the roof was framed, because I think you, know, you can see a lot of, uh, of um, houses of that era in town that have the shed roof dormers, mm -hmm. um, probably in close number to the ones that would have the reverse gable dog house room. It's, uh, it, it's much more conducive to, you know, usable space. That's and it, it really, if you look at the house, we, we were going to also, um, if you look at that lower left, we were going to re redress the house with all new trims. Um, it's going to have a, a fresh new look, but still be period correct, we believe. Um, and uh, I think the only thing you would really notice the difference is the width of the dorm. It, it really comes down to that. Since the doesn't, porch doesn't come to forward to the street any further. We, and we are going to, re I think that, I'm guessing the stairs that you re you go up to the front door, there's a little carve out where the front door entrance is. You might be able to see it on the plan. And we're going to have to rebuild all those because I think they're right now already um, encroaching into that front yard set back for that maximum 10 feet. Um, and, but we, we can correct that very easily with just a little grade change and then start the first riser and treads there. So it, it, it's going to be completely reskinned on the front um, with period correct kind of a, a feel. It's, it's going to look like an old house still. Thank you. So I guess the challenge I'm having is, as Mr. Miller mentioned, that there was a, a mitigation of opening up this porch and the porch isn't considered part of that front setback. And, and I'm looking at this master suite redesign, which by the way is beautiful. The symmetry of it's beautiful. The use of space is beautiful. You have multiple closets, some, some possibly benefiting the, the office uh, isn't clear to me, but I see potentially three closets straddling this main suite. And I really see the extra closet and the widening dormer, which is an expansion of the nonconformity, as, I don't want to say excess because it's beautiful, but it's hard to expand a nonconformity simply for beauty and aesthetics when it's nonconforming. I, the offset of that front porch kind of, I think, help mitigate the fact that it's not going further forward, even though it's expanding the nonconformity. So I guess I'm, I'm asking, you know, where is the practical difficulty in this design? I mean, it's beautiful, and it's, a, you know, a spectacular master bath with symmetrical sinks and a beautiful tub surrounded by windows and a gigantic shower and a water closet, all the things you would want in a newly constructed home. But there's multiple closets. I don't see the practical difficulty in this design that requires this expanded dormer. Okay. The um, I, I, I guess I would ask you to look at it this way. If you took that, it didn't widen that front dormer. Okay. Um, where would that leave you with roughly the same program elements that the client was asking you to include with, with the amount of closet space that's left? It may seem like a lot. It, it, there's a lot of low head clear where all, all these roof lines are coming together. It's not what you you might think. And I mean, it maybe it wasn't clear with that, but it's uh, you know, it was, at this stage, I didn't talk intensely right. about that. But it's I mean, the request that he may or may not have had of you has been accomplished. I don't doubt that. The question is, you're asking for a variance, and it was proved based on mitigation that's now been removed. Um, and your client would be glad to, I'd be glad to listen to your client respond to this question. Would you consider continuing to open up the front porch as the previous variance was approved, or are we sticking to the concept of not opening that porch and still requesting this change without? You hear the consensus from many board members that yeah, yep, you had medication and we're not seeing that anymore. I just want an answer to that question because I really can't have two people. Would we, conti would we uh, consider reopening, reopening the, porch the porch as part of this project? It, it, we can't introduce economics as simply issue of economics right now. Right. Because frankly right now if we can't do it, we're probably not going to do the project. 
That's, that's the economic reality of it. I know you can't consider that, but right now you all know the cost of labor and the cost of materials. Right. So it is a, increased substantially. So that's not a factor. So right now it, it is a factor for us. Right. We probably would not go forward with the project because the costs are just absolutely enormous to open that porch up. When you look at, as Art said before, and you look at the engineering, once we got into it as well, it was not that clear cut how we would accomplish all of this. The porch up top as well in the bedroom, it's really not that big. There's three porches. There's reason there's three porches because we could not find enough space to be able to have two closets. Three, you know, one big closet. Right. So our thought right now is this house is 1914. If we put an owner suite on this house, I think it provides more value for future owners than our front porch. Right. So the likelihood that this house will not be torn down by future owners increases with that owner suite versus the front porch. So that's where, so set aside economic consideration. I personally think if you had an owner suite with that sufficient closet space, it has more economic value moving forward and it decreases the odds this house will ever get torn down. I understand, appreciate it. Yep. Back to the architect. Did you ever, or did your client ever direct you to provide a design that did not widen the dormer? Um, we explored everything we could, you know. Um, I, I think that, unfortunately, the deceiving thing is when you're in this house, you are really tucked into a lot of clip rooms. Right. And um, you can open a door, and immediately you've got, you can't even hang closet. Right. I mean, it, it's a, it was tough. I'll be honest. It was brutal to try to get in that closet. Now, I, in, in my experience, it's closets, it's almost like uh, when we're doing a remod, that's probably one of the toughest things on a house of this era to get decent closets in. And um, I could show you a pile of paper that we, we went through to try to get to where we are just to get that many. I mean, just recently, we've kind of moved some closet space around uh, just in the transition between the for this rear. Uh, yeah, it isn't, it isn't really pertinent, but I appreciate your, yeah. your feedback. Any other questions from the appellant? Mr. Hart? Just one. Mr. Lang, how big is the existing living? Or is it like 19 by 19? What, is, what do you have on that? Um, I couldn't tell. Yeah. It's, I would say it's there, oh, yeah, probably. Could you answer the question back at the microphone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I brought my scale. Um, but, uh, yeah, let me just look at this real quick. I, I would say roughly. Roughly. Um, Thank you. 16 by 18. Yeah. <laughs> no, just, uh, it, it just kind of like for normal sizes. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Any other questions for the appellant? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Reddy. Mr. Lane, what's the lot size here? I, I know it's probably somewhere in the plans. You know oh, yeah. I'm, you know, um, I noticed online the, um, okay. that this. I, I okay, okay. Sure. I got it. Yeah, 54 okay. by 135. Okay. okay, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. In the audience or online, anybody not affiliated with this particular appeal have any comments about this appeal? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Board members? Well, you want to take another shot at it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask you. He was, he was taking some ownership of it before. I was before. waiting for it. Um, you don't have to. 839 Ridgedale. Um, I will move to approve. Um, obviously, I had concerns about the changes here, but the, the, the problem is, is really due to the fact that this is an older house that sits and has sat what is now too far forward on the lot and um, what's being asked here um, is very reasonable to do within the context of this home. It's just that the home was built way back when, a little too far forward. So that's what's causing us to, to, to have to um, uh, consider a variance. Um, and because of that, I believe that, that the basic problem is really not self-created. It's, it's kind of a unique circumstance, the house being a little too far forward. Um, a dorm isn't just appearing here. There was already a dorm. It's just being expanded. So I think it's a, it's a, uh, um, a reasonable ask. And for those reasons, um, I believe that uh, even though the, the, the change was made, 
you know, to that first floor. I think I think it's still a reasonable ask here by the by the owner, and I, I don't think it will do any harm. And I think it will actually enhance enhance the neighborhood. Um, so for those reasons, again, I would move to approve and tie it to the uh, plans as submitted this time. You have a motion to approve. Mr. Reddy, second? I'll second it. You have a motion to approve and second. Do we have any comments about the appeal? Mr. Reddy. Yes, I concur with Mr. Miller on this one. I think this is a pretty straightforward uh, variance request. It's a pre-existing non-conforming home, kind of a smaller lot in an, uh, with an older house uh, that provides at least to me enough unique circumstances that I'm comfortable seconding uh, the motion made by Mr. Miller. Very good. Any other comments? Seeing none, can we please call the roll to approve? John Miller? Yes. Ron Reddy? Yes. Carrie Alba? Yes. Jason Kavaser? Yes. Kevin Hart? Yes. Bridget Bully? Yes. Eric Bonner? Yes. Congratulations. Our last and Yes, it's just our last. Our last appeal, case number 22-49 for 839, oh, excuse me, for 479 South Old Woodward, case number 2247, Petitioner Birmingham Towers. Nick, you want to introduce yourself to the world? Yeah, I don't know. Jeff was doing so well, I figured that maybe we can keep him up here, take us home, Jeff. <laughs> and, you know, no, it's not. It's worth a shot. My name's Nick Dupuy. I'm the planning director here. Uh, Brooks Collin, my colleague, is on vacation, lucky him, so I drew the short straw um, here on a Tuesday night with y'all. Very good. <coughs> so Nick will be presenting uh, appeal number 22-47. Point up the plans to have something to look at. And as I understand it, you'd like to read the case description, I'll go over some staff notes and then we'll do some questions. Sound good? However you want to present it. All right, I'll do it that way then. Um, appeal number 22-47. The owner of the property known as 479 South Old Woodward requests the following appeal and variance. A, the applicant's requesting an appeal of the planning board's decision on September 28, 2022 to, to deny a revised final site plan and design review application for 479 South Old Woodward. I've got to pause and make a brief correction um, in your packets. Uh, the conjunction is or between A and B here. In the noticing, it was and. I'm here to tell you it should be and. And is the correct conjunction here. So I'll make that correction if you're mind, in your minds. If you don't mind. So and B, Chapter 126, Article 4, Section 4.46A, Table A, requires the off-street parking for total for site to be based on the land uses Furthermore, Chapter 126, Article 4, Section 4.50D enables parking requirement reductions for a property in the B3 zone when there's combined within a single building an office use, a residential use, and a restaurant use. This applicant uh, is required to provide 113 spaces on site. The amended site plan provides 39 spaces on site. Therefore, a variance of 74 parking spaces is being requested. And because this has been going on so long, the staff notes are a little significant. Um, beginning with September 23rd, 2020, uh, where they got their original final site plan approval from the planning board. It was a five-story building, one, store, uh, one story of residential plus parking, the other four being purely residential. Uh, it's, of course, the subject site is not within the former parking assessment district, so those commercial and residential off-street parking requirements need to be provided on site. That site plan in 2020 required 75 spaces based on the uses, and they ended up providing 84, uh, which was an excess of nine. That included 14 spaces on the ground level. Um, if they look familiar, it's because they came here to request a variance for those 14 spaces uh, in 2021 uh, to be within 20 feet of the building facade. I want to note, too, here that um, within those 84 required parking spaces, it was still only two levels of parking, but um, the second level, they utilized a significant number of subterranean lifts, so it was kind of a de facto third story. 
um, based on the lift situation. So that's how they were able to squeeze so many in this tight site originally. Fast forward to uh, September 28, 2022. A revised final site plan was presented. Uh, the building uses was modified to consist of purely commercial on the first floor, no more parking save to um, two spaces on the east side. Uh, the second floor was modified to a commercial office use and the rest three through five remained residential. The revised site plan has 26,000 square feet of commercial space with the initial plans, uh, as I mentioned, only one floor of commercial had 6,200, so quite a, quite a contrast there. Uh, this revised site plan also eliminated the, uh, the entire second level of underground parking, um, which is a considerable amount, along with the subterranean lifts. Um, this additional commercial space, uh, along with eliminating all that parking, changes um, the conditions from an excess of nine to a shortage of 74. So at that planning board meeting, uh, of course, it was a very robust discussion. It, it was noted, and to note here for the record, that the residential uses on site are fully parked, which is a requirement of other B4, D4 zoning uh, zone properties in downtown Birmingham. They, uh, the applicant has stated numerous times that they've encountered structural engineering issues, issues uh, with this property that uh, precludes them from going lower. Uh, they included a letter in your packet as well from an engineer. Um, the planning board discussed uh, just quite simply, they couldn't reconcile the sheer number of parking spaces being requested, uh, or deficient, I should say, and they did end up moving to deny the revised final site plan by about a four to two. I made this one in your packet. Um, even further uh, background, the applicant did try their hand at being included in the parking assessment district, which would enable them to uh, not have to provide those commercial parking spaces on site uh, over a very long period of time. It ended up uh, being determined that the time limitation for the special, special assessment was over and that we could not add any additional properties into that uh, assessment district, nor could we have them uh, pay any sort of retroactive fee to be entered into the district to enjoy the benefits of that district. Um, the most recent one, that was done in 1989, so the assessment expired in 2009. That's how far along ago that was. Uh, finally, it's also worth noting that there is a zoning ordinance amendment being um, handled at the same time as this variance request final site plan review. The ordinance request, um, paraphrasing a little bit, is essentially modifying the overlay district standards to provide uh, D4 zone properties that were not or are not in the former parking assessment district to request a waiver from the city commission through a special land use permit process. So effectively, they would be um, requesting, again, from the city commission uh, through a full special land use proper, uh, process to not have to provide those 74 spaces. So that's happening concurrently. Uh, I expect there to be plenty of questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll try my best at those. And of course, the applicant team is here for any as well. Very good. Board members? Mr. Campbell, sir. Yeah. Just fundamentally, you changed the order and on the two requests. So just, and I guess maybe I should ask, we should ask the applicant this as well. But we need to decide first whether or not the board erred in denying the revised final site plan. And if they did, and we overturn that, we still have to grant them a variance, right? If it's, I may. Yeah, I just want to make yeah. it very clear as to what we're looking we, at. And we should. Um, if I may, Bruce, kick it to you. We had a long discussion with the city attorney about this. Uh, procedurally, what that and means and what your options are. It's, it's you need to consider, you know, you're considering both. You know, the A is going to require a separate motion and B is going to require a separate motion. So if you granted A, I believe what your question was, yes, you would, they would need a variance for those parking spaces. So effectively, just in hypothetically, if we grant A but deny B, they're no further along, right? Correct. Okay. And I guess, can we just confirm with the applicant that they are? We come and they come up here, okay. I guess, yeah. All right. Well, the other piece is that we're, there's 
there's kind of a different approach on a variance, but they're they're in the process, which is coming up in the first week of December. Is that correct? Yeah, the public hearing for that ordinance amendment is at the city commission on December 5th. Which in some ways is essentially a variance. It's an ordinance they want a waiver for, which is sort of what we do, right? So it's it's another version of a, a city commission variance. I think that's a reasonable statement. Right. Uh, although, just to be clear, it would be tied to an entire special land use permit process. So right. technically, it's not, it's not a guarantee. Right. And all those other D4 projects that were in the parking assessment district, A, they were in it when it was an active program. B, they were able to contribute to it to offset those expenses, and this client doesn't have the option to do that. So right. it, isn't, it isn't the same thing. They'd be asking for a waiver because they don't have that opportunity. That's right. Is, there, is what they're proposing. That's right. All right. I understand. Mr. Reddy? So during the planning board meetings, was there any discussion why they – wanted to add an additional 20,000 square feet of commercial space. And I'll let the applicant confirm, but from what I understand, it's um, hyper-specific to the tenant that they like to bring in. Um, we can ask that question of the tenant. Yeah. Okay. Or, excuse me, it was just an opportunity that they have, I believe. Right. And then the follow-up would be, as soon as that additional commercial space came in, then did the parking requirements change at that particular point in time, just so I understand the fact better? So, so they did change, but um, I think it was the addition of the restaurant that bumped it up even further, because uh, restaurant's the most intense parking requirement we have, that one per 75. So that's, I don't know if I'm answering your question. That, that you're, you're getting to it. I'll yeah. ask the, I'll ask the. Uh, yeah, it's the commercial requirement that spiked it. That's what I. And then I'll a see. restaurant requires, you know, for, for so many, remember we just did it with Venetia. Yes, correct. That's you know, for I'm every thinking. hundred square feet, five spots, or whatever it is. So that was probably the most, as you said, intense use, requiring the most number of spaces, mm -hmm. pushing so them even further. So to summarize, when the additional 20,000 square feet of commercial space came in, the fact that there's a restaurant involved increased the parking space requirement, and that's strictly to satisfy the particular request of a client they have in mind. Is that accurate? That's the way I understand it. And if, okay. and if I could add, uh, I'm recalling now that uh, in the original 2020 final site plans, that second floor was mostly uh, amenity space for residential for residential tenants. Lots of storage, some uh, mixed use space, if you will, gaming or meeting areas, and those don't really require parking. It's the units themselves that require parking. So exchanging that space for commercial space effectively took it from zero to however many okay. in those specific areas. Can you give us a, a for the record a, a brief description of you've got one subterranean level you have two which is obviously deeper explain the lifts how are those applied to parking yeah so i'll use my hands i'm kind of a hands uh, gesture guy so you had the ground level there were 14 spaces there you had one underground level however many spaces you had a second and this was from the 2020 site plans right a second underground level and these subterranean lifts uh, once you pull the car in, it would lower into the ground below the second level and you could park another car on top then to get that car back out you'd have to get uh, you know summon if you will that lift back up from underground right to get it out so that would be about valet application probably right in order to be able to do that yeah or say you know each residential unit gets a little residential stall purposes, maybe right, right. and uh, they can control it with key fobs what right. have you well, any other questions for the city Saying none. Thank you, sir. Of course. Gentlemen? Good evening. Stephen Esty from Dykema, 39577 Woodward Avenue, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Um, I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Birmingham Towers. I just want to <clears throat> step back for a minute and give a little bit of history. I think Brooks did a nice job summarizing it, but I want to explain Brooks, a few Brooks things. replacement. I mean, Nick. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> he did write most of the material. You're, you're higher than Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, this has been going on for about two and a half years. Um, <clears throat> it really all are, originates from the fact that this is the single property in the D4 district that is not included in the parking assessment district. 
So <clears throat> for a long time, um, the owner of the property has been working to try to figure out a solution that would enable this property to be market competitive with everything else that's in the D4. So the first thing they did was they went to the parking assessment district. I mean, uh, to the advisory parking committee, rather, to talk about the parking assessment district. Um, and, the, and the idea here was that there was a thought at that time because Brookside, for example, had been allowed into the parking assessment district after the parking assessment district was allegedly closed, that there is an opportunity for other properties to get into the D4 district. And we felt there was a compelling argument for this property since it was the sole loan property in the D4 district that was not included in the parking assessment district. And I don't, I don't know, if, I think we included this, but I don't know if you can see this, but this is the property here. And it's the only property of all of the D4 that's not included in the parking assessment district. So it's, it's really at a competitive disadvantage. And we went to the advisory parking committee and they really agreed. The, the comments from the minutes of October 6, 2021 um, were, were the following from the APC members. Um, that the zoning requirements for this parcel require mixed use, but that there were not sufficient ways for the applicant to meet the parking requirements without the use of public parking. Uh, that the APC could not vote to recommend one way or the other regarding the PAD since it seemed to no longer exist. Um, and essentially they said, look, we can't do anything about this. We understand it's a problem. Why don't you guys go and talk to, you know, the city commission or their council and figure out another solution. So we did. Um, we went to the city commission um, and essentially we found what we believed was a provision in the ordinance that would allow a error in the formation of the, of the D4 PAD district to be corrected. Unfortunately, legal counsel and staff disagreed with us on that. Um, we went before the city commission. They had a lot of sympathy for what we wanted to do, and they felt it was the right thing to do to, to, to modify this development so that it's more appropriate for what they want in the D4, more consistent with the master plan, uh, and, and more competitive with the existing D4 properties. But they essentially said, look, our hands are really tied. Um, we, we want this, we want what you're proposing, but we don't feel that we can include you in the PAD. And so they encouraged us to go back and find um, another solution, either through a variance or through working with the planning board on a revised plan. Um, and, and what we ended up doing is we ended up going back and looking at the ordinance. And I, the ordinance, it really is not um, a waiver like the ZBA, and I want to explain why. So <clears throat> when we looked at the, the original ordinance under 3.02, um, actually 3.04. So these are the specific standards, 3.04, section four, the D5 zone. And in the D5 zone, 5C, it says, or 4C rather, it says, new buildings constructed or additions to existing buildings in the D5 zone must meet the requirements of the downtown Birmingham overlay district and the D4 zone except that the height of any addition and new construction in the D5 zone may be over the maximum building height up to but not exceeding the height of an existing building on a directly abutting D5 zone property. And here's the key. If the property owner agrees to the construction of the building under the provisions of a special land use permit. So we said, oh, okay, so the D5 has this option of exceeding height if they get under a special land use permit with the city commission and the planning board. Maybe that's something that could also apply to D4 with respect to this parking issue. And so we proposed an amendment, an ordinance amendment. We went before the planning board. The planning board gave us some good feedback. Um, they, they considered the idea. They said, this is something that might work, but we think it's too broad. Go back and do these things. We did, we went back, we revised it with the help of staff. I think we got to a version that everybody accepted. We went back before the planning board they voted to approve that ordinance and send it on to the city commission. The city commission has now set a public hearing to consider whether or not to enact that ordinance. In the meantime, um, there was a lot of discussion about coming to this body uh, in, in that if we get a variance, we don't need to amend the ordinance. 
um, and everybody sort of recognized the problem with this sold D4 property. And so we went and, and took the plans to the planning commission. Um, the planning or the planning board reviewed those plans. And I think they generally, if you look at the minutes, I think they want this type of a development over what was previously approved. What was previously approved was basically a parking garage on the first floor with very small commercial units that could be like a nail salon or some other. What we're proposing is what the master plan and what the, the, the code contemplates, which is a commercial use with walkability, uh, a large scale you know, commercial furniture store, or something similar to the like that would be low intensity in terms of the parking needs, but would um, be much more palatable to that area and, and much more beautiful, frankly, for, for what's there and much more competitive with the other D4 properties. And so some of the comments at, at the planning board on the, uh, on the day that they denied the plans were, Chair Klein summarized his opinion of the two main issues at hand, which are the streetscape on Hazel and the parking issues. He stated that in general, the uses proposed in the development are acceptable to him. He also stated his concern about the number of parking spaces. Mr. Kozik said he feels as though the plan is a good plan, especially compared to the former plan. He also feels as though the development and general area are walkable and have ample access to two nearby parking structures. Mr. Williams stated his discomfort in approving a project with the deficiency in parking. Mr. Whipple Boyce stated that she feels as though it would be irresponsible to approve a project with deficiency in parking spaces, and it went on and on. And, and so everything was related to the parking. I mean, it, it wasn't the plan that was the problem. It was the fact that we're the only property in D4 <laughs> that can't get in under the parking uh, uh, requirements. So under D4, if you're in the PAD, your commercial uses don't need to comply with any of the parking requirements because the garages are available. Your residential does, and ours meets that. Um, however, if this property were in the PAD, it would have that benefit, and it doesn't. <laughs> and so um, I, I think, you know, if the Planning Commission or the planning board, I'm sorry, I go so many, I go so many places, it's always the planning commission. Um, if the planning board were to hear from this body that we, we understand this unique issue, this unique hardship, and the practical difficulty here, and we will approve uh, the spaces, then I think the plan would be approved, move forward, and there wouldn't be a need for the ordinance amendment. Um, and that's why we're asking that, that this board, because essentially the planning commission punted to this, to this board, we're asking that this board review this and 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 reverse that decision, send it back to the Planning Commission with the amendment, and then they can work through whatever remaining issues they have. Um, they just weren't comfortable making that decision on their own or sending it to you to, to, to request making that decision until you had an opportunity, I think, to review it fully. Um, the second piece, obviously, that we're requesting is, um, is the variance itself. And I mean, we've, I, I, don't, I don't need to spend a lot of time on it. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but we went through each of the, each of the four elements in our papers. Um, this property is, is a very unique property, I think, as everybody knows. Um, it, is, it is, the overall lot size is 0.423 acres. It's long and narrow, and it's situated on two corners with frontage on three streets, South Old Woodward, Hazel, and M1. And because of the size and narrow configuration of the property, it, it really can't support street level retail and with commercial uses and residential and provide parking. And that's the problem. We've, we've, we've provided a, an engineer's letter. We can't go down two levels underground uh, and park without a, a, a significant structural integrity problem to the adjacent property. And that letter's in your file, and that's also why the existing project could be jeopardized in terms of the parking, because we've now discovered that this underground parking is an issue at this site. Again, none of this is applicable if, if this D4 property is in the PAD, but we don't have that option at this point. So I think that um, in terms of um, special conditions applicable to the property, if strictly apply, applied, well, if, if the parking is strictly applied to this particular property due to its unique location, size, and the fact that it is the only D4 not in the PAD, it will suffer a prejudice that no other D4 property suffers in, in, the, in the entire city. Um, and likewise, the literal enforcement um, will result in this hardship because we won't be able to bring the type of development to this site that that master plan calls for, that the city would like, 
that I think the applicant would like. It's not about a particular user. It's about a particular type of use. It's about the ability to put commercial on the first floor, a large retail commercial, national retailer of some type, and market that, which would be competitive with other D4s, and then to also have office space and residential above it. And, and that's, the, that's the goal here. We, we do have a particular user in mind. We have a couple particular users in mind that are both incredible quality national retailers that would be a great asset to the community. But the, but the bigger issue isn't the particular client. The real issue is this property deserves to be treated the same as all other D4 properties. And it should not be prejudiced and treated differently with respect to parking than all those other properties. Um, and so I, and again, so that will be consistent with the spirit of the ordinance, the master plan. It will be giving substantial justice to this property owner, but also to the area of other property owners in that area, because they're going to have a much better development with walkability, with commercial uses on the first floor. They're not going to have to look at a parking garage. Um, all of those things will contribute to making this uh, a much more viable site. And each of those criteria, I think, meet the four criteria under the, the, um, the ordinance for a variance here. Uh, so with that, I mean, we're happy to answer any questions that you have, um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit more background in terms of where we were and how we got here. Mr. Morgan, yeah, may I add a little bit just so that it's clear? I know you don't allow two speakers. Let, let's ask some questions, and if something comes up that would be appropriate for you to answer, we can do, go that route. Let me start. I have a few. So um, I guess my... I want to get to the standard and make sure we understand what we're actually... Well, I think I want to ask that question first. I guess my question is, I've got a, several questions, but the first one is, you want us to appeal the planning board's decision, which was simply, you don't have a, enough spots, we can't approve this plan. I guess from the standpoint of us listening to, reading what the planning board said, whether we concur or we don't, that they like the concept. I mean, there's no reason to not like the concept. It's a great concept. The question is, is it appropriate for this piece of property and is there enough infrastructure and parking to support it? So when typically when someone comes in appeals, they say, I believe they didn't look at the proper standard. Or I right. believe they... Tell me what exactly you're asking so, us to look at as an appeal per for an appeal purpose. So you're correct, Chairperson. I mean, I, it, you know, the issue here is that the, our plans met the criteria of the ordinance for site plan approval, but for the parking issue, and everybody knew that going in. And so, the, but including the, you, you and your client well, sure. knew going in that you didn't have sufficient parking. Absolutely. I right, mean, right. Th that's been the issue from day one. Right. So. Uh, so, you know, under Michigan law, if you meet the site plan criteria, it must be approved, right? The only issue was the parking. And, and the, the, the issue at hand is that this particular property is disparately treated from all other D4 properties. And the Planning Commission was not willing to make that decision or even put themselves in a position where they were requesting you to make the decision. They just said, we can't approve it like this because we, 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 we don't feel we're the right body to deal with it. And so we're looking to this body to say, okay, we can solve this problem. They have technically met the criteria for a variance. This is a very unique issue. I can't think of another one that's repeatable like this. This is a large variance, we understand, but there's a very specific and particular reason why this was created. And all we're doing is truing up this one D4 property with all other D4 properties. No, I get that. I guess what I don't understand is whether we overturn or, or, or um, you know, change the decision of the, of the planning board with regard to that piece of it, you would require a variance regardless. For sure. So right. why aren't you just asking us for a variance for the number of spots? I, What's I think the purpose when, of appealing the planning board? I think when we talked to staff uh, and, and asked what we what the path was to this body, it was suggested that these were the two paths, and we thought, well, we will pursue both. Um, and, and I think, you know, obviously, if this body feels it doesn't have enough information to reverse the planning board's decision but feels it should grant the variance, um, you know, that, that would be fine with us. I mean, we, we would go back before the planning board and work out whatever remaining details uh, there are with the site plan. Yeah, my assumption would be if, if we gave you a variance for the number of spots, then the planning board could look at it irregardless, bad word, regardless yeah. of the requirements of parking. I agree. So I guess I'm just, as a board, whenever someone asks us to appeal another board, we want to know what do we need to look at? What are you suggesting was done Understood. that needs an appeal? And I, I, don't, I can't wrap my head around the intent or the purpose of an appeal. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing that was done in that particular meeting was that, you know, everybody glossed over 
uh, everything other than the parking. And so uh, because the parking was this mammoth issue in the room, um, we, a plan that otherwise met all the criteria wasn't even given a chance to come to this board by recommendation of the Planning Commission because it was just flat out, we, it, we can't do this, right? And I get it. I mean, it's a, it's a large variance. I mean, we all, we've known that from day one, and it, that's been the problem. It's an outcome looking for a solution. You know, right. we, I'm still <laughs> not focusing on the variance, though. I'm focusing on the appeal. Mr. Canvasser also has a question in line yeah. with that. Yeah, and this, this ties into it. So as Mr. Dupuy said at the beginning, we, and this is, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page. We are being asked to determine whether or not we should reverse, not remand, but reverse the planning board's decision and grant a vision and grant a variance as opposed to or and i think that's important because if we even no. if we granted a variance yeah i don't I, I don't i think you could i think what you're being asked to do is make two decisions I, I, and that's what i think he was saying i think he's saying that you you have to because we've asked for both you you have to look at both and make a separate decision on both because both of those are appealable. So I think, I think the, 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 uh, as to the first one, if you said we deny the, the request to reverse or remand, I mean, you could remand, I suppose, uh, we, but if you denied that, you could go on to grant the variance. And then what would happen is we would say, well, we have a variance on the property for parking. We'd have to go back and represent a plan to the planning board, and they would have to take into consideration the variance. Um, you know, and that's that's certainly an option. Or you know, you could you could remand it, I suppose, with with the variance being granted as well. Uh, I mean, we're we're really looking to we we've tried every feasible angle to try to address this issue, and I think the city commission is working with us too. I, I I think you know the preference would be to have this body address it, then we don't have to deal with ordinance amendments and whatnot. But um, and I think we do meet the criteria. I think this is a very uh, unusual circumstance, um, and it's one that we've been working hard at for almost three years now to try to correct. Uh, and, I, and maybe we should have come to this body earlier. I don't know. I mean, I think I think we 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 didn't only because we felt we had viable paths through these other angles that didn't work out. Sure. So uh, maybe back to the city because we're, we're we've been told to use the word and as opposed to or. If it was or. We could grant A or we could grant B. But if it's... We were told to use and because if it's that's and. how it was published. Right. Okay. Because, well, and that, I guess that's my question is whether or not it's been published properly because if it if it uses the word and, and we, for example... Mr. Campus, we still have the ability to only approve one or the other regardless of how it's published. Well, no, but that's my question. If it's... If, if we uphold the board's decision... And, but grant a variance, the board is still denied a final site plan. Correct. And so that's what I'm asking, whether or not it's even published properly, because what's the effect of granting a variance but upholding a final site plan? What's, what's, the, re what's the recourse? Well, we, they could go we'd back have with to, the new information and say parking is no longer a factor. Well, but do they get to go back if the site plan's been denied? Well, we would, have to, we would have to redesign the site plan and resubmit it with the variance, whatever variance right, so then they have to come back here because we're tying it to the plans, and if they're changing the site plan, then they still have to come back here. And if we turn them down and they go to the city commission and get their slub, I mean, there's, no, there's no, lots I, of different I understand that, but board. It, yeah. that's why I want to make sure it's actually even published correctly, because and or or. We talked about this with the city attorney this afternoon, and it is published properly. Okay, okay we, we need to, uh, you, you, you're, you're yeah, deciding on A and you're deciding on B. They don't have to be the same. Okay. It don't have to be the same decision, but we're deciding Correct. on both. Right. So then, as a follow-up question, just so again, we're all on the same yeah. page, I want to make sure that you, we are on the same page in terms of the standard of review while we're reviewing Part A, the review of the final, uh, of the uh, revised final site plan, or the denial of the final, the revised final site plan. Would you agree that it's a we're reviewing it as an abuse of discretion standard? Yeah, I think that's correct uh, in terms of part A, and then I think part B you're reviewing it as you would any other variance request. Okay. All right. Yeah. Very good. I think procedurally I'm I'm good now. Yeah. I still have some more questions on okay. and then I'll I'll talk, let's take more questions. So so we understand kind of where we're coming from. So my next question is that you know I of course we I was part of the approval of the, the variance for the previous design, which 
you know, I live right near this property. It, it was an exciting design, regardless whether or not whether or not it's the most economic design, whether or not it's the most beneficial for the, the potential tenants. Um, but my question is, when you have a you know single story structure tearing down and you're building a new, the limitations of the property are the limitations of the property. And I, I get that it's a unique D4 project, but I assume when the property was purchased or contemplated as a remodel, this knowledge of the parking assessment district was was a known factor. Um, you don't have the ability to contribute to it, thus you don't have the same, I guess the same um, challenge of, I want to be a part of it, but I can't get into it and I can't pay to it. So I, I guess I'm trying to understand when, a, when the, anyone comes in and says they want to be able to build to the maximum benefit of a property, that maximum benefit is what's allowed within the zone that they're in. So I'm trying to understand as you expand it or, or the due diligence on the subterranean work was incorrect in your first design, how do we potentially grant 70 some parking spots when obviously there's a design that would work on that property would not require as many? Yeah, so I, number one, um, I think when this property was purchased, they were looking at the fact that Brookside had already been admitted to the PAD and believed that there was a vehicle to get into the PAD. But it was in the district that allowed for it, it had just expired. It wasn't. Oh, well, no, the PAD had long been uh, closed before Brookside was allowed in. Right. And what happened was they were allowed in when they probably shouldn't have been allowed in, but nobody knew that at the time. And so they got the benefit of that. But their hurdle was that it was expired. Your hurdle is you're not even allowed to be in it, plus it expired. Well, but we didn't find that out until after we, we so, so we saw Brookside, right? Brookside got in after the fact when there was no PAD in existence, and everybody let them in. They got the benefit of the D4. We looked at it and thought, well, we should be able to do that too. We have a compelling argument, and there's a and they've done it before. There's a precedent, and it wasn't until recently that we ran into the problem about the subterranean issues as we started to try to dig down to questions from the planning board. But ultimately, it was a, it, once we saw that all these avenues to get this D four competitive with every other D four, it, 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 we were at a standstill because it was like, okay, we can't build. Uh, I, uh, we cannot build a property with it, with the same criteria that every other D4 can build. And that became the issue. So it, it's really it's really as simple as that. It's the fact that you have a sole property that's that's been selected out without uh, the rights of every other D4 property as to parking, which then limits what you can put there from every other D4 property. No, so now this property is constrained while they aren't. Right. No, I understand that presentation, I guess. But can we acknowledge that Brookside is was within the PAD overlay, it just had expired. Is that not true? Not true. No, they were brought into the PAD. They were brought into yeah. the PAD when it was expired? Or, I mean, It was already expired. Uh, that's correct. Uh, Brookside development was introduced into the PAD after it was expired. But was it in the overlay of where the PAD is allowed, or was it similar to this where yeah, it was? Yeah, just like us. They were D4. Yeah, but uh, yeah. you're saying you're D4 that isn't exposed to the PAD, and that no, no, was, no. but it was expired, or no? Am I misunderstanding? No, they were, out to, they were out of it, too. The boundaries were changed to include the Brookside. Specifically for, based yeah, on the for request. For Brookside, right. So they were just like us, basically. So they were yeah. they were brought in, and, and we weren't. And, and I get it. That, you know, they, they looked at, at it harder later and figured it out that maybe we weren't we weren't uh, that that process wasn't the, the proper process. But the, the the simple point is, all the applicant is trying to do is put its property in the same position as every other D four property. Just like every resident should have the same right of the R one district or whatever. You know, I mean, th this is a disparity that has been inadvertently created that we're looking to correct through, I think, a, a vehicle that allows it to be corrected, which is the variance me methodology. Uh, and again, I think it's a, it, it, is a, it, it is a unicorn in this. There's no other property that's like this at this time. Can we just call the, the, can we just call the flagpole a property a unicorn? Yeah. So now we have two unicorns. Now it's all on the, uh, on the boat. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it was stuck in the boat. <laughs> Mr. Reddy? <laughs> Mr. Esty, can you explain to me why we're not putting the cart before the horse here? I mean, we have a, you're scheduled for a December 5th meeting in front of the city commission, uh, duly elected officials of the city, I might add, that would have a better insight into all the variables with regards to whether this is something the city wants to go forward with. So could you explain to me why it wouldn't be better to wait for the city commission to rule yeah, on so this? We, we... Because that gives you a much broader... 
I would say, scope of right. the various factors that right. we would want to look at from the master plan point of view, et cetera. It, it, yeah, it's a good point, and it's driven by the, the rules, essentially, okay. by the timing Fair rules. Enough. So we, we were in a position where we had to file within a certain time frame or our filing would be waived. And in order to preserve that right, we had to get before this body. We couldn't allow the city commission to go forward first before this body rendered a decision. I mean, it, you know, it, it, I, had we been able to do that, we might have been able to do that. I think there's also a benefit in the sense that this body granting the variance eliminates any need for the whole ordinance process to move forward, which is a timely process. I mean, it has to go through public hearings and Wasn't reviews. it true, too, that you'll be required to, to be into a slub, which could create, create new criteria for the project that may make it right. less viable? And, and, well, and that's another, that would be another, another. So it's a protocol. Issue. Yeah, for oh, sure. Fair enough. Yeah. That yep. answers my yep. question. Thank okay. you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, Mr. Hart. Yes. Um, if you could elaborate a, a little bit about this D4 property, is, is there a reason? I know you might have touched on, but it, what is is there a reason that that's not included? It's at the very southern tip of that. Yeah, so really <laughs> we went through, um, there's different analysis, and the answer is nobody knows. Uh, a staff came up with an analysis that they everybody was speculating, I think, about. We think what happened is there, there was that big Birmingham place it, it sort of, at one point it was a bus station, I believe, and it, it, it sat, sort of served as a wall. And so at the time, as these districts got expanded, they, they just did overlooked this property. It just didn't get wrapped in because it was on the other side of this wall. And we, we laid all that out in, in, our, in our various filings to the Parking Advisory Committee and the City Commission. And at, at the end of the day, we spent a lot of time, I think both, both us and staff and, and the city attorney, looking at the history and how this occurred. And the conclusion was nobody could really come to any definitive conclusion as to the reason it was excluded. Nick, do you have a comment and on an that? An additional layer on that um, is that I mentioned that the, late, the last assessment was in 1989 for the Chester Street deck, and the D4 overlay district did not exist in 1989 until the late 90s, early 2000s. So there was a 10-ish year gap where the D4 or, uh, overlay didn't even exist. So they had another 10-ish years to potentially request to be put in, but again, nobody knows why they didn't at and, the time. And over the, year, just in, in, in over the years, the, 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 the exclusion of that has, is probably one of the reasons why that property looks the way it looks now. Would, would that be true? I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty abysmal part of that yeah. parse, you know. The it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, it's also the south end hasn't really seen a lot of development yet, too. So yeah. the entire south then, end might be able to. And then further, just one question more: uh, What if it, if it was included in the PAD, Would would this would this proposal conform? Would it do, with oh, yeah. parking? It would, yeah, for sure. Would well meet it. What like how is it is it close? I mean, what. What is well, we meet all the parking for uh, the residential. It's it, it's completely for parked for residential. It's okay. just the commercial that's the issue. So oh, I know, but that, that's what I'm saying. But if it's in the the PAD, all the commercial goes all to the to the garages. Then yeah, the requirements are are waived, but then they have fees to good. contribute to the structures. I get it? Do. Okay, good. I just wanted to you know get a little bit of yeah. And, oh, by, and by the way, I mean just just for disclosure, I mean we offered to pay those fees. We calculated what they would be. I think it's 240 grand. Uh, we, we calculated them uh, and offered to pay them as part of the request to get into the PAD, but um, again, we couldn't do it because we couldn't find the vehicle to reopen the PAD. Right. Okay. Mr. Elder? Yeah, um, I sort of have some concern with what we're being asked to do, which is effectively treat your property as if it was in the PAD, which to me has some semblance of you're just asking us to redraw the map, which would be well beyond our authority to do. So I have some concerns about I get, my question is, how are we doing something other than being asked to redraw a map that we have no authority to redraw? Yeah, so what I'm really asking you to do is grant a variance on the basis of the fact that this property being in D4 is the only property not in the PAD, suffers a practical difficulty, a unique hardship, and that the only way to grant it substantial justice is to grant the variance so that it is in conformity with other D4 properties. It is, a, it is an island of D4 that has has a parking requirement that makes it virtually impossible to develop it 
to the full, fullest extent under the ordinance and in compliance with what the master plan would intend. So just one comment about that is, you know, it's stated multiple times that, that your client does not have the ability to use the full range of what's allowed in the D4 district, but they're not necessarily allowed to, they're not necessarily entitled to be able to develop to the full range and have every use allowed in the D4. They have to meet the parking requirements. Well, I mean, right, and that's the point, is that they, they are ham, hamstringed because they can't meet parking requirements because they are the only D4 property that has to park commercial. And so it, it, this is the crux of the issue. And this is why the variance is established because this particular property suffers a unique hardship and it suffers a extreme practical difficulty. And the only way to do substantial justice is to say it can park commercial off site too. And, and that's the crux of why a variance is needed. I mean, it's the definition of, of a variance. And, it, and, that, and really, more than anything that was here tonight, this property meets every one of those criteria in spades. Um, and, it, and it really is, it, you know, this, no harm can come from this because all that's gonna happen, I mean, they've already done the parking analysis of all the garage and there's plenty of space. All that's going to happen is they're going to park the commercial in, in the garages. <laughs> you know? So it's like like every other D4. Uh, that, that is, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I guess I've seen some attempts, and this isn't rezoning, of course, but there's been some attempts in on different boards and including our board where someone says, I want to be able to use my property to its greatest, fullest extent. Right now you really have this proposal with a ton of commercial on the first floor and a change in residential, different than the previous design, but... Do you have any evidence in front of us to show us what else could be built that would have less parking requirements? Why that's something that wouldn't make sense? Like, and not that the economics matter, but I guess the challenge I'm seeing is, here's what we want to do. It requires 74, give us 74. Right. Yeah, so, What's the version that requires 34? Yeah, What's so that's a good point. So part, part, of the, so you're, part of the additional parking is the mezzanines, right? Uh, there's two mezzanines. Uh, that increases the parking. Uh, one is also the addition of the whiskey bar or the restaurant. Uh, which I think 725 square feet, and that does have a higher count. So, I mean, again, the, with those things modified or adjusted, you know, could the count drop down to 60 or 65? You know, yeah, it probably could. I mean, it. it I mean, that. I'm not. I'm not disputing that. I mean, that's that that. But again, I mean, a, a substantial variance will be required regardless because of the the commercial use period. I mean, any any real commercial use of that first floor is going to require a significant variance because it's not in the PAD. Well, because you're saying you already accomplished the residential parking on site. Yeah, it's fully parked. So what's what's the typical, or what would you say that first floor commercial requirement is for parking? Could you estimate based on just the first floor? I could probably tell you if you'll give me a moment to look yeah, back at the planning board estimate. reports. <clears throat> like uh, if you take out the mezzanines, Nick, and maybe the... Or just the first floor, regardless of whatever else exists. And obviously not the residential that is accomplished on site. I don't think for the commercial on the first floor, only. about 62, so it's the bulk of it. And that's before the, uh, I mentioned briefly in the case description, there's some allowances for uh, subtractions based on the collection of uses. Right. So it's 62 purely commercial on the first floor without all those other considerations. So I guess I would say at this point, you, we, most of our questions have been, have been answered. Do we want to approach A first, or do you want to get... Oh, please, go ahead. Well, then I guess to the city first, is this a property that um, one of those parking agreements could be utilized at? Like a shared parking agreement? Yeah, with a 555 five, five or another building, something like that. Technically, uh, I'd say so. I mean, but I do believe, and I'll let them answer, that that was explored way back when, earlier than 2020, at the... Community Impact Study Preliminary Plan. Um, and at the time, the 555 building had a lot of existing leased parking, and they were not able to provide that much. So, yeah, so now I'll ask you whether or not a, a parking agreement. Well, I'll tell you exploring. absolutely about that. So, so yeah, I mean, it's it's not possible. I mean, they're suing the city currently over over these parking issues. He's come to every meeting and, and not talked about our project, but ostensibly about our project, but uh, uh, complaining about the parking 
I mean, there's no way we would ever get an agreement with 555. Is 555 the only location that would qualify? Because there's a distance requirement, I believe, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, and it's just it, they can even have a variance for distance. I think. And there's plenty of parking in the structures. I mean, they've, they've, you know, it, it, and there's just there's there's a lot of capacity. The Birmingham place as well to the north. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. And the, the other thing I don't know what. The, the other thing I would say, I mean, I, I know this isn't user specific, but the users that are currently in line for this project and waiting desperately to, for something to happen are, are furniture stores. Uh, large, large, you know the names, and and I and I, they're going to not have anywhere near the need for parking that other types of commercial uses would have. I mean, you're talking, you know, I mean, people walk around those stores. It's not like you have a hundred people at one time. I mean. So they're, they're, you ever they're, waited at a restoration hardware to see the furniture? It's, well, it's not a restoration hardware. Right. So, but restoration hardware builds in other stuff. I mean, they have the, the restaurants Restaurant and, and all that. Right. I mean, th this is a fact. But it's, it's definitely on, on a scale of that type of quality. So I think, you know, you would get people coming in and, and looking at furniture and leaving, and you're not going to have high traffic counts. Right. Did you have more? Nope, that was my question. So I guess my question to you is, do you want to, I mean, obviously, as a board, we can start voting and, and start have a discussion about A and B. Um, I still don't know that I... <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I look, I, I, at the end of the day, I think that what we're really looking for is the variance. Right. And I think if we don't get the variance, it's sort of a moot point. And even if you were to deal with, I mean, we can withdraw the request for A. I think the applicant has the ability to do that and, and say that we, we would withdraw it here. And um, and and then you could just have a vote on B. That makes more sense to me. Yeah, I so think so. Okay I mean, that, I, you know, again, okay? again, I, I, we're not looking yeah. to uh, appeal, um, you know, the, the decision on A to any court or anything. It's just, I think we were just trying to make sure we dotted our I's and crossed our T's. I understand. So, you can make a comment during the public if you want to make a comment. Yeah. No, you can't make it now. After, yeah. Okay. So, uh, board members, any other questions? And, so, and then we're going to approach B. Seeing none, thank you. You're welcome. In the audience, would you like to call up and are you not affiliated with this particular appeal? You're not affiliated with the owners and a, anything like no, that? I'm a neighbor. Oh, please, come on in. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just give us your name, your address, and tell us your thoughts about the um, yeah. appeal. Yeah, Steinberg at 411 South Old Woodward, so right next door to where this is going to be. And, and I agree with a lot of what you said in, in that this uh, needs to be made a better place because next door, I mean, the way that it looks is not good. However, to go ahead and allow them to do something that they knew did not exist at the time, in other words, I don't know all the terminology, but PAD, I mean, they're going outside of what your authority really is. And to have 75 more parking uh, places that uh, they're going to need. It's 74, just to make okay. sure. The okay, correct. 74. Sorry about That's that. That's okay. Uh, it is just, it just makes no sense to me, especially with what's happened with the reconstruction of Old Woodward. More parking places have been taken away. So this is just going to cause all kind of chaos, I think, and uh, it's something that should not be done. Now, originally, what was supposed to be this, uh, this building, I think, was supposed to be all residential. Is that correct? There was a small amount. A small amount on the first floor. So now they're asking for a whole second floor of commercial because they can make a lot more money, of course, by having this commercial. And so then they're crying, oh, my God, uh, you know, we, 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 we need these spaces. They really don't need the spaces. They want to make the profits, in my opinion. And to say that, for instance, a furniture store is not going to require a lot of parking, to me, is nonsense. I mean, if you look where Art Van was, you look at other furniture stores, they have huge parking lots because there's going to be a lot of traffic with the furniture store. So I just would like to see this property being built, but it should be built as it was supposed to be, all residential. And then we're back. They comply. There's no issue with parking. And that's, that's just how it should be. So I think for you to go beyond that, when they knew that this uh, should not, that they can't build it the way that it is, is just going way beyond what is, <laughs> what is right and proper and probably legally correct. 
Thank you. So, okay. Thank you for your, your thoughts. Anyone else on Zoom or in the audience that would like to comment on this particular appeal? Seeing none. Board members. Mr. Miller. I, I'm not going to make a motion right now, but I would like to make a comment. Um, I, th I think I like this project. Um, however, I believe that it's really, in a practical sense, really hard for our board to determine within the context of, of this meeting the appropriateness of this project in its place within the city. Um, my problem is that I think there are tremendous nuances with respect to the surrounding site, uh, pedestrian circulation, vehicular circulation, and, and so I believe that we as a board would almost need much more study and much more expertise to really make a, a good informed determination on this request for, again, 74 parking spaces. So it's, I guess what I'm saying is, is with, with regard to just the, the information and the length of this meeting and what our board is about, it's a, it's a really tough call to, uh, to weigh that appropriateness. Um, given that we're not a we're not a, a planning board, basically, um, and I just wanted to to make that that comment because that's kind of how I've been feeling as the back and forth has been going on, that it's uh, um, a difficult situation for for our board, in my view. Yeah, just another comment for, for discussion <coughs> is I know there were prior plans that were approved, but. I'm a little confused on whether there was whether it was alleged that the prior plans cannot be built because of those engineering difficulties, or were they changed just to accommodate a new tenant, but could have been built before? I don't know if anyone has further. My understanding, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, that the previous design with the two subterranean levels has some challenges engineering-wise. I don't know if it's economically not feasible, or if it's structurally not feasible. I mean, sometimes structurally is about how much you spend, but a structurally feasible. So that isn't feasible to meet any particular parking requirement because they could potentially do commercial on the first floor with subterranean levels to meet some of the parking requirement if they can't do that. So regardless of whether or not the design has changed, they're insufficient of a number of parking spots for either scenario okay. because of the challenges of the subterranean parking. Okay. Thank you. Sure. No other comments? Motions? Sure, I guess I'll be the one who makes the motion. Um, in regards to appeal 22-47, the property of 479 South Old Woodward, uh, the variance request A has been withdrawn, leaving request uh, B in that regard. I would move to deny the request. Um, I am certainly sympathetic to the plight of the petitioner here. Um, and this is a building that I don't think anybody in the city is going to argue, or a lot anybody in, our, in the city is going to argue, needs redeveloping. Um, as Mr. Miller mentioned, where, where, I have, and I, where I have some trouble is the number of parking spaces and the size of the variance. Um, you know, where do you draw the line? Is it 10 spaces like we did the or seven or whatever it was the first time, putting aside whatever engineering issues may be. Is it 20? Is it 30? Is it 70? You know, where is that line? And so I don't know that I have heard enough to say that, hey, 74 is the number and we can't get any lower. Um, and so I, I, I think that strict compliance with the ordinance at this point still will not unreasonably prevent the petitioner from using the property for a permitted purpose. It may not be to the maximum extent that they are hoping to use it, but I have still, I, I, I have not heard that strict compliance will not unreasonably prevent the petitioner from using the, the property for permitted purpose. Um, certainly there are some difficulties compliance with the, complying with the ordinance. Um, but I'm not sure that the variance would do substantial justice to 
other property owners in the area. Uh, there's already a substantial parking issue. Um, alleged. Alleged parking issue, thank you. I don't know that we have enough information before us to determine whether or not this would exacerbate that alleged issue further or impact it or not impact it at all. Um, so, again, while I am sympathetic to the issue and, and I hope that there's a solution to be had, I just don't think the variance of 74 parking spaces is something that I can support. And so for that reason and the reasons I've mentioned, uh, I move to deny. I would uh, second, and um, I, I believe, as I recall, I was in favor, I might have made the, the motion of, of the previous appeal, because you'd like to see something happen on this site. Um, and uh, even given the benefit of a doubt, if it was a close call in terms of, of parking or parking location. But, uh, but again, it's about, uh, as Mr. Canvas has said, the enormity. Of what we're of what we're looking at and the complexity of this multi-use building fitting in and and the appropriateness and is that 74 really really the the, the required number um, to uh, to advance this project and uh, for those reasons I would second mr. canvassers uh, motion any comments mr. ready yes I'm going to also uh approve the uh, agree to approve the motion I think we do have sufficient facts here to make a decision um, this is clearly a complicated issue uh, we've heard extensively from the appellant and the city on this and I think the facts are clear uh, that we can we have enough evidence here to go ahead and uh, make a motion and uh, that this is uh, a very large variance and for that reason I'm going to support the motion any other comments Mr. Hart Yes, I, I'm not going to support the, the motion. I think that uh, that the dynamics of what's going on in the area, we, we know the history of some of the uh, extensive construction that happened in adjacent to properties on Woodward, where we had um, you know, structural uh, issues that arose that, were, that, that could have been catastrophic, that, didn't, that, were, that, that had to be uh, handled separately. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm well aware of the constraints of, of a, co a complex structure next to an aging structure uh, in, a, in a very important part of the, of, the, of the city. It appears to me that the, the fabric of the zoning, for however it happened, it, it's not consistent that this, this one little piece on the very southern end of this grouping is, is, is taken out, whether it's an oversight or whether it was intentional. I didn't really get an answer. I would like to have known a little bit more about that. I think that was something that should be focused on. But um, I think that uh, something uh, of this magnitude, a, a, a project like this, will be a great enhancement to the city, bring a lot of, of, um, of additional employees uh, that will be, need to be hired, uh, a lot of more dynamics going on in the city besides just residential. So um, I think there's a big benefit for for the city. <coughs> so I will not support the uh, uh, the uh, motion because I, I think this is something that needs to happen at that location. It's been it's been in this condition for decades, and uh, there's obviously some challenges to it. And I think we need to uh, uh, we need to understand that and uh, to comprehend that in our in our choices. So I won't be supporting. So I think there's a lot going on here. I think with uh, Restoration Harbor coming to the to our site and CB2 coming to the city of Birmingham, it's going to be great for exposure and traffic. And I'm sure that has placed a lot of pressure on national furniture retailers to seek out other commercial first floor exposure in the city of Birmingham. And um, when I think about Art Van's project on Woodward and the parking that I have been inside that structure many times, the parking that was required to um, meet the needs of those buyers, as well as the previous design of this project that had less, you know, commercial on the first floor, and some of that additional parking was able to be um, contained within the structure. And even though the demand for this property has clearly changed and hopefully increased the value of it, I just don't think I have enough information between what the real number is to properly use this property to its 
best use while asking for a reasonable number of, of parking spots, whether or not the city um, commission in its own control and, and power can address this concern um, under a slub or some other, um, some other method, but a 74 spot variance in a town that has a perceived parking issue um, simply to provide a variance because we like the design, I think would be irresponsible, at least for me to vote for it would be irresponsible. Um, clearly, and I, listen, I live across the street, I'll take the whiskey bar every day, but it's really about what is the right number for this project to make it make sense for you so you can use the property to its best use without asking for a number of spots that just may be unrealistic or, or, or irresponsible for us to approve without more information. So for that reason, I will support the motion. Seeing no other comments, can we please call the roll? The uh, motion is to deny. Yes. John Miller? Yes. <laughs> yes. Ron Reddy? Yes. Pierre Yalba? Yes. Kevin Hart? No. Richard Lilly? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Good luck with the City Commission. Mr. Johnson, any other business that we have to talk about? At least on the record? There is not. Very good, sir. Anybody in the audience or on? Thank you. Though. Thank you for your comments. Um, on Zoom, that would like to talk about something that's not related to the appeals we just heard today. Seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Yes. We have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.